Are you ready to read an article from the news with me? In this Learn English with the News lesson, we'll read a news article together so you can get comfortable with advanced grammar, vocabulary, sentence structure, and practice your pronunciation at the same time. Welcome back to G4's English Training. Of course, I'm Jennifer, and this is your place to become a fluent, confident English speaker. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to our article. Today we're talking about debt, debt in the United States. So first I'm going to read the article in full so you can understand the overall idea and you can pay attention to my pronunciation. And after we will go through the article line by line and I will teach you the most common vocabulary and sentence structure and grammar points that you need to understand the article. So let me read the article in full. Treasury Secretary warns U.S. could default on its debt as soon as June. The U.S. will reach the debt limit on January 19th, and then extraordinary measures will need to be taken. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen wrote in a letter to House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. She said that the Treasury Department will pursue those measures, but they will only last a limited amount of time. It is unlikely that the government will exhaust its cash and the extraordinary measures before early June, though she said there is considerable uncertainty around that forecast, Yellen wrote. She urged lawmakers to act in a timely matter to increase or suspend the debt limit. Failure to meet the government's obligations would cause irreparable harm to the U.S. economy, the livelihoods of all Americans, and global financial stability, she wrote. The debt limit is the maximum that the federal government is allowed to borrow after Congress set a level more than a century ago to curtail government borrowing. Congress has, in the past, raised the debt limit to avoid a default on U.S. debt that economists have warned would be financial Armageddon. That's what lawmakers did in late 2021 following the last standoff over the debt ceiling. Don't worry if you didn't understand a lot of this article because now what I'll do is I'll go through the article line by line and explain the most important points. Let's start at the beginning here. Treasury Secretary warns U.S. could default on its debt. First of all, I hope you noticed in my pronunciation that I was not pronouncing the B in this. The B is silent. It's pronounced as debt, 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 as soon as June. Debt is simply money that you owe. That is debt. Most likely you have debt for your home, credit cards, your car payment, and your student loans, other things as well. Now, when you default on the debt, it's when you do not make the required payments. So for your mortgage, every month you're required to pay a certain amount, let's say $5,000. If you do not pay $5,000, then you default on your mortgage and the bank can take your house from you. So that's the consequence. So the U.S. could default on its debt as soon as, this means the earliest point. So June is the earliest point where the U.S. could default on its debt. I made the notes for you here and this lesson PDF is available as a download and I'll share the link at the end of the lesson. Let's continue on. The U.S. will reach the debt limit. Now, remember, later in the article, they explained what the debt limit is. So we'll talk more about what that is. The U.S. will reach the debt limit on January 19th and then extraordinary measures. 
So a measure is a, a tactic or a step that you need to take to solve a problem. And then extraordinary measures are measures that go beyond what you would expect. So let's say there's a terrible accident. As an example, because it's extraordinary measure, so I'm thinking of an extraordinary situation, I might say the doctor had to take extraordinary measures to save the child. So measure steps to solve a problem and then extraordinary more than you would expect. So that's extraordinary measures. We'll learn more about that in the article. And notice my verb here because you take extraordinary measures. That's what I use and that's what you see in the article as well, will need to be taken. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen wrote in a letter to House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Okay. She said that the Treasury Department will pursue those measures. So pursue is another word of saying take action to accomplish. We generally use this with goals, major goals. For example, I'm pursuing my PhD. So this is a major goal and I'm taking action to accomplish it. Pursue, pursue. This is a verb. So notice right now it's in the present continuous because it's an action I'm taking right now. I wrote the definition here and remember we do generally use this for goals or major accomplishments but they will only last a limited amount of time. So the measures, remember, those are the extraordinary measures. So they will be limited. It is unlikely that the government will exhaust its cash and the extraordinary measures before early June. When you exhaust something, it means you have used all of it. You've used 100% of it. Now you can use this with money and in this context, it makes sense, but for your purposes, you'll probably use it in the sense of options or solutions. So let's say you're at work and you're trying to solve a a problem for your company, you might say we've exhausted all options, which means you have no options left. You've used all the options available and you haven't solved the problem. So it's a negative thing. We've exhausted all our options. Or if you're trying to refinance your mortgage because your mortgage payments went up. So you have more debt and you don't want to default on that debt. You don't want to default on that debt. Well, then you might pursue different options, pursue, take action towards, you might pursue different options. And then when you have tried every single option, you could say we've exhausted all our options. Nobody will give us a loan. So those options might be talking to different banks, talking to your family, friends, you've exhausted all your options. So it's a good expression we generally use when you're trying to solve a problem. Okay. So it's unlikely that the government will exhaust its cash, which means use all of its cash. So let me use that when you exhaust something to use all of something. So to use all of its cash and the extraordinary measures before early June, though she said there is considerable uncertainty. So uncertainty means you're not sure what's going to happen, right? It could be 50%, you succeed 50%, you fail. But when you say considerable, you're making the amount of uncertainty more. You're increasing that amount. So maybe it went from 50% uncertainty to 80% uncertainty. So this is when you 
make the noun more, basically. To make the noun more, so uncertainty. Around that forecast, Yellen wrote, she urged lawmakers. When you urge someone, you try to convince someone or to persuade someone to do something. So <laughs> we hear this a lot with people who give advice. Maybe your mother, my mother urged me to become a doctor. <laughs> you should become a doctor. Here are all the reasons why. So your mother is trying to convince you. She's urging you. So this is a verb. You can see it's in the past simple here. So this is to convince someone, to strongly advise, <laughs> or to persuade. She urged lawmakers to act in a timely matter. A timely matter, there is no set time, but it's when you do not take more time than is necessary or ideal. So it's just general advice. You should act in a timely matter when you pursue your goal. So you don't want to take more time than is needed, but the amount of time is not specific. As an example, you might say, I didn't get the job because I didn't act in a timely matter. Maybe it took you too long to submit your resume, too long to follow up with the company after the interview, too long to provide your references. You didn't act in a timely matter. Okay, let's continue on. Failure to meet the government's obligations would cause irreparable harm to the U.S. economy. Irreparable is damage that cannot be undone. And we use it a lot with harm. So I'll highlight this. So damage or a negative consequence, but I'll write damage that cannot be undone. Now, not a lot of things can't be undone. Usually if you make a mistake, you can correct that mistake. But a lot of people say that climate change has caused irreparable harm to our environment, our planet, whatever you want to say. So without the word irreparable, irreparable, it sounds negative, but there could be a solution. But if I add irreparable, it sounds really negative because there's no solution. So we might use this with a climate related problem. Now, there could be a circumstance that caused irreparable harm in your relationship with your husband or wife or with friends. For example, I cheated on my wife and it caused irreparable harm to our marriage. So this is saying that you cheated on your wife, which means you had a relationship with another woman. Of course, it could be you cheated on your husband <laughs> as well. And the action cannot be undone. So you cannot restore or fix your marriage. It's another way of saying your marriage is over because of that irreparable harm. Now, let's hope this doesn't cause irreparable harm because that is very negative. So the if they default on their loans, which is the same thing as failure to meet the government's obligation because it's their obligation to pay their loan. So if they default on their debt, it would cause irreparable harm to the U.S. economy, the livelihoods of all Americans and global financial stability, she wrote. Wow, that's a lot of negative, isn't it? The livelihood. One's livelihood is how you support yourself. So it's simply how you get your money. 
because we already talked about climate change, I could say climate change is threatening the livelihood of farmers. So people who earn their money from the land. Now notice I didn't go as far as saying cause irreparable harm. I just said threatening, which is less severe. Climate change is threatening the livelihood of farmers. So how farmers earn their money. Let's continue on. The debt limit, oh, so now we get the definition of a debt limit, which they explained at the very beginning. Remember, debt is money that you owe. The debt limit is the maximum that the federal government is allowed to borrow. After Congress set a level more than a century ago to curtail government borrowing. Here, our verb is curtail. And curtail means to limit or reduce something. Since we're talking about government spending and I talked about mortgages earlier, let me give you an example related to that. The government increased interest rates to curtail consumer spending. Curtail means to try to reduce, to try to reduce, to reduce or to limit consumer spending. I could also say COVID curtailed my <laughs> vacation plans, obviously. COVID curtailed my vacation plans. So it limited my ability to travel. It reduced my ability to travel. COVID curtailed my vacation plans. Curtail is a more formal sounding word. We definitely hear it a lot with official communication from the government or from companies, but you can use it in your day-to-day -day speech. It is just a more formal choice. Let's also talk about borrow. The debt limit is the maximum that the federal government is allowed to borrow. When you borrow something, it means that you receive something. So you might say, I borrowed this book from my sister. I borrowed this book from my sister. So I received this book. And my sister was the one who gave me this book. And of course, when you borrow something is only temporary, you're supposed to give it back. You're supposed to return it after a period of time. And that's why we use it with money. When you take out a loan, when you acquire debt, you borrow money, right? I asked my parents if I could borrow money and they said yes. So my parents are going to give me money and then at some point in the future I am going to give the money back to them. Now we don't say my parents borrowed me money. This is wrong. It's incorrect. It's I borrowed money from my parents. That is the correct sentence structure. I hear this a lot. My parents borrowed me. No, I borrowed money from my parents. That is correct. So do some example sentences in the comments and I do not want to see this. Let's continue on. This is our last paragraph. Congress has in the past raised the debt limit, so increased it, raised it, to avoid a default on U.S. debt. You already know what default is. Default is when you're not able to make your required payments and they want to avoid it. They don't want that to happen. Before, we saw a default as a verb to default. Here it's 
a noun. I know it's a noun because I have my article a, uh, and we only use articles with nouns. So this can be used as a verb and a noun. You already know the definition. It's the same. A default on U.S. debt that economists have warned would be financial Armageddon. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Remember, our other term was irreparable harm. It's the same thing because I'm sure you've seen the movie Armageddon, a giant asteroid is going to hit Earth and obviously Earth would be destroyed. That's irreparable because we can't put Earth back together again. So it's the same thing as saying irreparable harm is just a more dramatic way. That's what lawmakers did in late 2021. The that refers to raised the debt limit. That's what they did in 2021 following the last standoff over the debt ceiling. Okay, a standoff is just when two parties cannot agree and they're not willing to change their opinion. So this party says, don't increase the debt limit, the debt ceiling. And this party says, increase it. Now, if it's just back and forth, no, yes, no, yes, and they're not changing their opinion, then we can call that a standoff. So now you know the main points to understand this article. So what you can do is you can go back to the beginning and listen to me read it again and practice along with my pronunciation. And of course, you can practice all the vocabulary that you learned and you can download the free PDF in the link below. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Amazing job with this lesson. And if you look in the description, you'll find a link to the free lesson PDF that you can download. And if you found this video helpful, please hit the like button, share it with your friends, and of course, subscribe. And before you go, make sure you head on over to my website, j4esenglish.com, and download your free speaking guide. In this guide, I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. And until next time, happy studying.